So this is chapter four on statistical inference and the objectives for this chapter um, are to just review the basics of, you know, probably modeling with probability, uh, doing estimation, understanding some things about bias and variance. And hopefully you guys are all familiar with those things. So I'll go relatively quickly through that. Um, the more interesting parts where we discuss the interpretation of these things. Um, that's one other objective for this chapter. And he, and then this cool section where he talks about why he thinks it's a mistake. And I agree to use hypothesis tests or statistical significance to attribute certainty from noisy data, as he puts it. Well, that's clearly a mistake, but people don't don't actually say things like that. Oh, I now I'm sure, but they kind of think it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they kind of imply it in the way they draw their conclusions in the uh, in articles. So uh, he talks about um, the first part. He talks about um, what is inference. Well, inference is this idea of you know getting some data, doing some operations on it, and then finding some kind of estimates and along with associated uncertainty. Uh, about some whatever parameters or predictions you're interested in understanding. It's a very general thing, but the idea is you're trying to uh, use data to infer something about some underlying model, generally speaking, right? Or underlying po uh, population. And in that vein, he talks, you know, this book is full of, as you'll see, Amma, as you go through it, uh, these guys love lists. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't mind this either, but uh, it seems like it's always like, oh, there's three roles of inference. And he says, the, and this is, seems right to me, uh, one role is to infer the characteristics of a population from a sample. That's the most common type. That's a very common thing. You, you have some, you're trying to understand something about uh, a bunch of patients or whatever. You only have a sampling of patients and they've, they've used that drug. And so you're, you're using only that sample, but you're trying to infer something about everyone from that. That's the sampling. Uh, inference. Another one is the, that's a sampling model. Another one is this measurement error model where we're trying to infer some parameters of some underlying model, but that model has some kind of measurement error. That is unmodeled, I guess. Well, it's modeled, but modeled as random effects. Um, measurement error. Like, and this is kind of the, the thing in this book, right? We're going to be doing things like this. Y equals A plus BX plus some error term, which here he shows the normally distributed one, but it could be other distributions, right? And finally, model error, which is, I, just, I summarize it as all models are wrong. <laughs> so there's always some kind of underlying idea that this model is not right, and there's going to be some imperfections and some errors due to that. And he says that he, this, this book is going to set regression models in this measurement error framework, the second bullet. Um, but the error that is there is also interpreted as model error, right? Because it's going to include some parts of the unmodeled things, truly unmodeled, not just modeled by random effects, but things we just don't include in the model. And and also, uh, it's sampling error is implicit, and then you know you think about the error, the model like measurement errors as being samples, uh, you know, drawn from an urn of some random distribution of random effects, right? Yep. So he talks about this um, <clears throat> sampling distribution. He defines that. This is again, this is a little bit of review again. Well, it's a sampling distribution. It's a set, and the way he looks at it. And I think this is kind of a theme throughout this whole book. He's going to always think about this kind of simulation mindset and that the sample distribution is the set of all the possible data sets that could have been observed if the data collection process had been repeated, right? And along with all the associated populations with those, those distributions. So that's what, um, with those data sets, right? So that's kind of what he has in mind. Like he always think about this like data generate, he's like a generative process, a generative model here. You have some kind of model which you could use if you knew the parameters to generate fake data, essentially, right? And as you, you assume your data came out of a model, you know, your, your underlying assumption is you have this model and your data was somehow generated by that model, but you don't know the parameters, so you're going to try to infer those parameters, okay? That's basically the, the kind of the overall context of this idea of inference with the sampling distributions. Does that make sense? Did I, did I summarize that? Well, is that what you got out of it, Ryan? You read it. Did you read chapter four, Ryan? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I also taught like research methods for years, so this is like yeah. Okay, so this, totally this is like the stuff right. that you told undergrads, and they just kind of glazed it over at you. And <laughs> just, you, know, you know, oh yeah, hey, right. sampling distribution. That's great. Yeah, that's but kind I'm of excited. Let I me mean, let's be clear. Um, I mean, but yeah, no, this is all very foundational stuff for sure. Yeah, in my view, part of this is just to kind of get everybody literally on the same page. 
for the rest of the book so that when he mentions, when he says something about sampling distribution, you know what he means, right? right. <laughs> you don't have to go look some other, because there's going to be like subtle differences in how people define things, right? Mm-hmm. And speaking of review, here's a whole bunch, right? Okay, this jargon, right? So there's a lot of this in the book. Okay, parameters, you know what that's, the unknown numbers that are in the, that determine the model, right? The sigmas, the slopes, the, well, here it is, the coefficients, right? The slope and the intercept, the scale or variance, which measures the, the scale of the, of the measurement error. Um, an estimand is uh, some summary parameters of data of interest. It's all pretty much review, right? Um, we know what standard errors are. That's the estimated standard deviation of the estimate as opposed to of the actual measurement, right? Uh, let's see, confidence interval. The confidence intervals is worth just spending a little bit of time on, and he does in here too. And mm-hmm. that um, confidence intervals represent a range of values of a parameter of a quantity of interest that are roughly consistent with the data. I had to read that out because it's like very easy to get this wrong, right? With confidence mm-hmm. yeah. intervals, right? Uh, so he, in words, like if the model is correct, right? You should expect in repeated applications, like a, repeated experiments of the same type that the confidence intervals will include the true value 50 to 95% of the time. Well, for 50, 50 sorry, 50% confidence interval, it should include the true value 50% of the time. And for a 95% confidence interval, it should include the true value 95% of the time. Now, note that's kind of, people know this, but they still sometimes will say things backwards. They'll say, oh, no, we, the true, you know, the true value is within this uh, 95% confidence interval, right? But it's not really quite right. It's not that the true value is in there. It's rather that if we did the same process over and over again, mm-hmm. this process would capture uh, the true value. Yeah. And then this last part is just a reminder about, like, when, you know, often the sample distribution is a normal distribution, and we know how to calculate um, the standard error from that by just dividing by the square root of the number of uh, measurements you made, right? And the confidence intervals can be used, you can estimate using quantiles in that case, right? Yep. So just to kind of drive this home, he has this um, plot in the book, which I generated, regenerated uh, myself. So this is a simulation of 100 draws from a distribution with a mean six and a big standard deviation of 40, right? But I'm doing 100 draws of that. So square root of 100 is 10. So we expect that the standard error should be like four, right? For that. So this is just straight, this is not the best. Don't quote, don't uh, use my R methods here as a, this code, by the way, has already been, um, this notes have already been um, posted to the, uh, what is it, what try to say? I put a pull request in, it's already been accepted. Merged, that's the restaurant thing. It's already been merged in, so you, should, you have this on online as well. Mm. Um, but this is my code for doing that. I'm not going to go over it in detail, but you can look at it. And but the, the key thing is what I do is I just sip, do a real simulation. I'm going to do a ten, a thousand, sorry, a thousand simulations of these 100 draws. So the experiment is 100 draws from an urn, essentially, right? Or 100 draws from sorry from a random uh, distribution, from a normal distribution, with mean six, standard deviation 40, right? The statistic that I'm doing is the mean of that, right? So that's basically what I do here. I just thousand times I draw 100 things from a uh, 100 numbers from a normal distribution with the mean of six and a sigma of 40 then I calculate the mean right I'm just saving them and I calculate the standard error using that formula right square you know the square to uh, standard, standard deviation divided by the square of the number of draws and this is the experiment right now in real life we only do the experiment one time we get our one number the mean and the standard deviation but here I'm going to do this fake data thing where I'm going to, oh, now I'm going to do a thousand of these experiments and see where the, my, what I'm trying to get to is where my confidence intervals would lie, right? So I'm going to generate confidence intervals using, um, using the T distribution here because I'm estimating the standard deviation. <clears throat> but I'll, if you're not familiar with that, I'm going to, that's the next chart to remind you how the T distribution works in, in this case. But in any event, I'm using the T distribution to estimate those, uh, 95% and 50% quantiles. And then I generate here the, uh, whether or not the um, the true mean is covered or not, right? I'm just gonna use that to, to, to check whether or not it's 95, covered 95% of the time and 50% of the time. And then I plot it. And this looks like the similar to the plot in the book, right? These are for each of these experiments of hundred draws, mm-hmm. right? I only showing a hundred of those experiments. There's actually, a, I did a thousand, but I'm just showing a hundred of them in this plot. Don't be confused the two uses of hundred there. And you can see that, yeah, 90, you know, often the confidence interval, the, the light line is the um, 95 percentile confidence interval, and the darker, bolder line is the 50th percentile 
confidence interval. And you can see, yeah, sometimes, like this case right here, this particular experiment, I didn't include the, it didn't actually include the um, uh, estimate, the true mean, right? But that's, we expect that, like one out of 20 times, we shouldn't. So there should be five in here I could find like that if it's correct on average. There's another one right there, right? So, and for the 50 percentile, of course, it's much, even much more common that it doesn't include it, because we expect only to cover, to cover the true interval 50% of the time. So it's worth looking through that and doing that simulation yourself just to really drive home the meaning of the confidence interval, I think. Although I, I, I believe that since he's kind of has a Bayesian focus, he's not going to really use confidence intervals that much. But I, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I haven't, I haven't read ahead, so I don't know. <laughs> but this is, this is what a confidence interval truly means, I guess. And you, almost every book on statistics has a plot like this. And then everybody promptly forgets about it, as far as I can tell. <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> Uh, just to verify, I did calculate, okay, I, how many times my 1,000 simulations did the, uh, uh, the true mean was covered by the 95% confidence interval, it was close to 95%, and how often was the true mean covered by my 50th percentile, it's pretty close to 50%, so it's, it works, right? Okay, that's, that was just for a little fun R code, I, you know, I don't know, it's, it's fun, you probably, I'm going to go ahead. You guys should look at this. And just please tell me how terrible this R code is, but it's probably no, it's good. <laughs> that's, 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 that's like that's like super proper like tidyverse stuff. Awesome, I'm glad to hear. That. There's probably I mean, something to do. With I guess somebody would say like, oh, you know, don't do the for loop here. Yeah, whatever. that's what I was gonna say. There's probably some way to do without a loop, but I just found that's, that probably, that's, not, that's like the only thing I could even yeah. remotely think of. But I, you know, what? sometimes loops are okay. I mean, it's very clear, right? Sure. You should. I think clarity is important. You, can, you know, if you like wrap things up too much and you know, uh, vectorized form, it can sometimes be unclear what's happening. And too, you know, what do you say? Being too clever, right? Right. Okay. So just a quick review. Of this concept of degrees of freedom. This comes up a lot when you uh, when you estimate the standard error from the distribution. You're using up like one of the degrees of freedom now, and you have to take that into account. And the book talks about that in some detail. Um, but the point here is that um, in that particular case, maybe a normal distribution, but you estimate the standard error from the data itself, that the, now the, the sampling distribution of the mean is a T distribution, a student T distribution, not a, not a Gaussian distribution. Now, um, and so that, you know, you just use the, like I do right here, just use this, uh, the, you know, T distribution, QT, um, to estimate the uh, error bars, right? I do want to note, though, that certainly as the number of degrees of freedom get larger, as approaching infinity, the student T distribution is approaches the normal distribution, and uh, it turns out, you know, usually thirty is close enough to infinity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's is that usually the rule of thumb, Ryan? I think thirty is like ah, yeah. I mean, well, because I think it's because well, the T distribution. Yeah, yeah, it, the, yeah. It's um, yeah, it is thirty. Thirty is like yeah, you're good. Yeah. So that's just a little technical thing that um, that's in here. Again, I think that when you're when you're doing when you're doing the regression in this book, it's going to be a little bit. They're going to use R stand arm, and you're probably just going to use the posterior draws, and not have to worry about this kind of uh, formulaic approach, right? This is kind of formulaic approach. Oh, what am I got here? I got to figure out the right formula, right? And you know, when the Bayesian methods, it seems like you don't have to do that as much. You just right, you just put in the right model and then you get the distributions out from the posterior draws. But I may be wrong about that. I haven't, like I said, I haven't read ahead in the book <laughs> to see what he actually does. All right, so the next section, where am I going on time? Okay, is uh, he's talking about some, now we're starting to get into some issues, right? So bias and unmodeled certain, uncertainty is one of them. Um, and, and, you know, an unbiased estimate is one that's correct on average. So statistics, uh, st statisticians often talk about that idea. This is an unbiased estimator. For example, um, this T distribution is a good unbiased estimator, right, for the mean, right? Or, no, I'm sorry, the mean is a good unbiased estimator for like a normal distribution. Uh, but, you know, he knows that in practice, it's typically impossible to construct estimates that are truly unbiased. There's always some issues. Uh, and the other thing is unmodeled uncertainty. There's other sources of errors that maybe in our, in our statistical model. These are the things you have to deal with. And he gives an example here of a, this is interesting to me. It's a poll of like, you know, this guy does this great poll. Like I'm gonna pull 60,000 people um, on their support of some candidate. This is a huge high powered poll, right? And mm -hmm. 
the binomial, so you calculate the error from this. And since, you know, if you use a binomial model, there is only like 0.2%. I'm like, now, okay, <laughs> now I know for sure that 52.5% of people are going to support this candidate. And my margin error is only 0.2%. Mm. And you look at that and you enroll on the face of it, that can't be right. <laughs> right. Right. And, and the reason for that, because there's other sources of uncertainty, and you know this, right? You know, for example, that that sample might not be that representative. So you probably might have a, a, a bias. It might be, there's some bias in there, unestimated, you know, your estimator there, if you say, is actually might be biased, right? Because, you know, maybe the people that to tell you to F off when you try to ask them a survey question are more likely to support candidate B versus candidate A, for example, right? And I think that's a fairly common issue. Um, um, or you just did a terrible job of who you sampled, who knows, right? Another issue is that this is, you know, a point estimator in time and, you know, people's opinions do change over time. So that's going to, this you know, that was these people's opinion that day, but you can't say with 0.2% certainty that when you ask them, when they vote, that that's still how they're going to be. Uh, and then finally, another source of error is that people's survey responses are potentially inaccurate too, right? So, uh, you know, they, they, you know, if there was a paper survey, maybe they actually just checked the wrong box. That could happen, right? Oh, wait a minute. I mean, I've done that before, right? Um, and same thing on a phone survey, press one for this, press Four, if you strongly agree, press one if you strongly disagree. I don't know how many times I wait, was it? Which one was strongly agree? Was it the bigger number or the smaller number? Oh, well. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so these things add more uncertainty. So you recommend some courses of action you could take to improve this. One thing you could do more data collection, uh, but not, I'm sorry, not, not more, but do the data collection in a, a better way by instead of doing 60,000 people do several surveys of only 600 people like at different times and different places um, to try to get some of that representation error in there right and opinion changing error as well. Um, and actually all three of those you start to measure those because you're doing separate little pieces and then each one the standard deviation of each of the 600 I'm sorry the comparison of those 600 the different 600 polls. That's a tough sentence okay the comparison of each of those 600 polls, 600 person polls would tell you some interesting information, right? Uh, let's see. Another possibility is expand the model, like include some demographic categories to try to take care of your representation problem uh, or to please control for it, right? And he says here, the last resort, you're going to say, you know what? I don't know, but I know in the past, the best you can do in these is two and a half percent. So I'm just going to add that. In, right? It's going to increase my error. And, uh, and that's, you know, so he says, like, for example, for this, if you thought it was two and a half percent, then the total real error for the 60,000 people survey is actually about two and a half percent points, right? It's dominated entirely by this unmodeled error. Mm -hmm. If you did only a 600 person, a single 600 person error, then a 600 person survey, then the error would be about 3.2 percent. You know, you add, add these things in quadrature. Um, so there you would say, well, that was a waste of effort to do, you know, 60,000 people because I'd never actually improved it very much at all. So I thought that was pretty so, interesting. Uh, where did we get the 2.5? Is this like from previous survey? Okay. Yeah, he just pulled that out, you know, it's the same experience or whatever, or knowledge of the domain or whatever. I don't know. That's why he says a last resort. You know, where are you gonna get that? You're gonna pull that out of your, you know, nether regions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, so uh this is again another so i guess it's kind of the pattern a little bit of review then talk about something about it right so this is a review of this concept of statistical significance and hypothesis testing and statistical errors these things are, you guys are familiar with these things i presume right mm -hmm. just like the standard statistical stuff um so i don't know if i even go through this but you know that you know statistical significance just means that you couldn't observe would not have reasonably expected to observe that by chance uh and you do that with a hypothesis test based on some testing statistics that summarizes your data, your deviation of your data from what would be expected under the null hypothesis. And this all kind of accumulates in this p-value concept, which is what is the probability I would observe something in my test statistic, at least as extreme as, you observed, as we observed, right? And for, for historical reasons, I guess, I don't know maybe the first guy used this, 0 0.05 seems to be the thing that we use. Um, there's a little formula, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, after all this, the authors say we do not recommend using statistical significance significance as a decision rule. And yeah, okay, fine, right? Hope that, hopefully, he'll give us some alternatives, and I think he will as we go into the the book itself. But um, 
And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the 4.5 too. But first, he also talks about, you know, often people talk about type one and type two errors. You're probably familiar with that, right? Type one error is falsely rejecting the null hypothesis. Type two is not rejecting a null hypothesis that is actually false. That's kind of standard statistics 101. But he says, I don't like that. No, that, you know, ridiculous because all, uh, I don't, in all the things we do, we don't really believe the null hypothesis can really be true. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Whatever you're doing, your drug is going to have some effect, for example, or you're, you know, um, uh, can't think of another example, but you know what I'm saying. There's, there's, whatever you're doing, there's going to be some something there. Mm -hmm. And so he says the more important idea is this type M error, where it's really the magnitude of the estimated effect is much different than the true effect, right? You overestimate is a common thing. And the other one is the sign error, which is you estimate some effect, but it's actually got the wrong sign. So he talks about the type S error rate. Um, I think that might come up later because we I don't think the book talks much more about it in this chapter. And the other one is this expected exaggeration factor due to type M errors. Um, so he says, you know, in 16.1, that's much further down the book, there'll be some more detailed examples of this. But this is certainly a concern because uh, that's, you know, when you only look in results with statistical significance, right? That means you've got this kind of filter, right? If you didn't see a statistical, yeah, statistical significance, you're going to toss that out and not look at that, right? But if you did, then you're going to look at that and you say, oh, here's my result. Well, that puts some kind of lower bound on the report magnitude of the reported results. So you're going to generally end up with overestimate, especially if you have like a small data set where the, the bar, the barrier for statistical significance requires a large effect. And then if you happen to by chance get a, you know, a, you know, 5% of the time, you will, right? A, a statistical, yeah, why do I keep stumbling over that? A significant <laughs> result, you will necessarily have made a magnitude error, right? Or be very likely to have made a magnitude error. And that's a concept I've never seen before. I thought that was pretty interesting to me. I'm like, oh yeah, I mean, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, so it's sort of like vectors, magnitude and direction. Yeah. That's what came yeah. into my mind, yeah. That's, that's true. So he talks about um, the problems with all this business of statistical significance. And he mentions in the book, and I'm not gonna go through them in detail, but I thought this is a great section, definitely worth rereading probably um, some of the pitfalls with this concept of uh, statistical significance. Ah, I got it out that time. <laughs> the uh, one of the pitfalls is that and this he says the first three are kind of everybody kind of knows but the last two are more, a little bit not as well known right um, or the first two are well known the last three are not as well known. The first one is well and you know this statistical significant is not the same as practically important. Nevertheless people often say oh this drug had a, you know, a significant effect. Well, yeah, a statistically significant effect, but it actually was a small effect overall, right? That happens with large power studies where people like do high power studies, they find some kind of effect, but you know, it's not important, right? Yeah, I always tell like, you know, like a lot of times, I'm sure you all get this too, but a lot of people ask me about like some study about, you know, science or something. All the time, yeah. And there's always like, Hey, what does this mean? Like when it's statistically significant? I, I mean, I say exactly what you say, which is it's it's not the same. It's not zero. It's it's highly <laughs> unlikely to be due to zero. It's highly unlikely to be you know just zero. Right. That's that's not. I mean, when you actually unpack it, that's not a very powerful statement. No. Right? Right. I think a lot of people, a lot, especially a lot of like civilians, put a lot of um, in headlines. It's really headline. Yeah. Right? It's, it's, yeah. 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 And. Anyway. And in the counterpart to that, of course, is non-significance is not the same as zero, right? right. So somebody reports like this, this such and such had no significant effect. Okay, well, what was the power of the study? I don't know. It could have some effect. You just didn't measure it well enough, right? So, but yeah, these things make headlines and people will come ask you, right? And they'll say, wait, what does this mean? Yeah. Did you see the study? They showed that this, you know, vitamin E. <laughs> right, vitamin E, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> some significant effect on something like... Uh, okay, immediately my my own filter goes on. I'm like, nah, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, now he talks about these other three pitfalls, um, which are a little bit diff more difficult to understand for me anyway. The first one was the idea of the difference between significant and non-significant is not itself significant, and he gives this example that you know if you had a study with a tw you know 25 plus or minus 10, you know a mean a mean of 25 and a standard deviation of 10. Um, that would be significant, right, with a p-value of 0.01, while a study with 
10 plus with 10 plus or minus 10 same error but just only a little bit smaller signal is now not significant anymore right but the difference between those is within the error with you know only like one and a half error bars right so it's not it's also insignificant the difference so that he, that's what he was saying i'm not sure what the what what he was trying to get at there though i was like okay <laughs> that seems to make sense but so did he what do you get any idea what that what he's trying to drive at there yeah i mean this is like a common um thing you know um like in especially in social sciences right because we love you know p-values of course and we love statistical significance and so um yeah i mean sometimes it's like you know these p-values that we report i mean the difference between some a, a significant and a non-significant result is is not very much in terms of an actual right. effect i guess you could say um yeah so p hacking has been something um also it's sometimes referred to as harking i believe something like hypothesis something harking. It, yeah harking or something like that yeah huh. so basically it's the same thing as p hacking you're doing stuff to kind of maximize oh finding, finding. it ties into the next bullet point yeah but um yeah i mean basically i mean i think what the the, the take-home message from the difference between significant is not significant is is just basically to say you know we think there's this massive qualitative shift you know between oh. between um a, a significant and a non-significant result and in fact that is not necessarily the case I think that's what he's trying to say. <laughs> does that help? Sorry. No, I think that does help you. Yeah, you're right. It's like, oh, this study was significant. It's awesome. This, you know, the other study was almost almost as same result, but it's like, nah, that's insignificant. That's much of what he's saying. I get it now. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Yeah, that clar clarifies it quite a bit. Yeah. And like with what you were, I think it ties into the fourth point about like steady sample size like it just if you're and also into the p hacking that like if you know all these things and you're just trying to get to one place they are forgetting the real reason why you're doing the studies like you're just trying to game the mm -hmm. system yeah yeah yep. so that's the last bullet point this idea of uh researcher degree you know researchers have all these degrees of freedom which can lead to this p hacking issue uh, and what he calls the garden of forking paths, right? There's all these choices you could take and there's this great yep. little garden here of possibilities. But one of the interesting things in this part of the But what chapter, about the fourth one? So he's saying that oh, you're right. like, if you have that. A, Sorry, that. a small study to yeah. be significant, like yes. you have That's to- That's like, one, you're right. Like it has to be really, really have an effect before you see it. Is that what he's yeah. trying to say? Like, if yeah, your so sample size is, is small. Right. He's saying this is a statistical significance filter we mentioned in the previous chart. That is that if you have a small study and you get lucky and get a statistically uh, a result, um, you will most likely be overestimating the result, right? Because it's a, uh, you know, your mm -hmm. significant effects have to be big. So if you see something, it's going to have to be a big effect. If it was a, really the real effect was small, you would, wouldn't, you would have not seen it under your criteria there. Right. But the, the last bullet point is where I thought was the most interesting part of this chapter um, was not the idea. I mean, we understand P hacking. That's where guys like sift through, you know, different analysis methods, different. Oh, let me try this. What's this variable? This variable. What about that variable? One of these has got to work, right? Um, I'll try all these different predictors and something's got to shake out here. Ah, I found something, you know, smoking yeah. when you're pregnant is uh, good in some weird situation if you're doing it on Tuesdays or something. I don't know. <laughs> That's how a lot of like early nutrition stuff <laughs> Can't be true. Happened. Like there's, I forget what the name of the guy is, but there's like a famous guy who like cherry picked a bunch of nutrition data, and that's one of the reasons why we think cholesterol is so bad now. Where no kidding, I a lot, a lot of modern, that. yeah, a lot of modern. Well, I don't know. I mean, there's still a lot of debate about it, but yeah, uh, a lot you need of to find or something to post on that. I would love to read that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so yeah, I forget what his name was, but like he only picked countries where like the relationship between eating meat or something like that and heart disease were positive or something uh, or you know huh so yeah yeah the, all of this stuff i mean I, like i used to do observational research in, in, in medicine which basically just means you know you're using um existing data right as opposed to a clinical trial where 
you proactively go out and try to recruit people of certain type, you know, demographics or, or whatever. And um, yeah, this is one of the one of the things. I mean, it's it's always kind of rife with problems. But I would say one of the things that's really important is, you know, especially when you're writing up the paper or you're trying to speak to stakeholders, it's just like be really clear about all of the things that you did, about all of the decision points. You know, what I, mean? I mean, this isn't a statistical argument I'm making. It's more of a yeah, or, you know, kind of reproducibility workflow thing. You know, which I find. I don't know about the rest of y'all, but I find that, that most of the time, those are the issues with people, not statistics. You know what I'm saying? Like how they organize information, how they how they made different decision points and didn't tell you about it, you know, or, or didn't act. I'm not, I'm not saying like they're doing it in, in um, intentionally. It's just like, you know, there's a million little decision points that we go. That's I think that's exactly the point that he's making here, right? He's saying this this is garden of forking pass. Right. You say even people that aren't intentionally p hacking, they right. unintentionally are just because, right? They're just making all these decisions after they look at the data. That's what he's saying. The, the key point there, right? It's like, you know, if you had different data, you would have made maybe different choices, right? Exactly. When you're when, when you're uh, working through the, your in your process, and and it's such an interesting topic that, that he actually gives a reference to this whole paper he wrote on the whole topic, and it's definitely worth reading. I look, I've read through it. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool stuff. Um, the chapter has some of the same stuff that's in the paper, but the mm -hmm. paper goes in a lot more detail. This, if you're interested in this kind of thing, but yeah, the basic idea though is simply that it's unintentional fishing. You didn't really, you wouldn't purposely doing this. Just that you know the data. You look at data like, oh, look at this. This particular predictor has got a big something on it. I'm going to concentrate on that now, right? But it could just been luck that that mm -hmm. that, that signal came up. So or bad luck, I guess, or whatever you want to look at. Just chance is what I'm trying to say, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's that's all. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly. something that we've been wrestling with, especially I say it's social sciences because, you know, we're some of the most guilty folks, I think, um, when it comes to this type of stuff. But yeah, we've really had to like, yeah, I would say when I started doing research in like psychology and psychiatry like 25 years ago, you know, very few people would use confidence intervals or very, you know what I'm saying? Like very few people yeah. would like, would set like a non 0.05 alpha level. Right. So I think it's, it's not even, I mean, at least as far as I can tell, it's not even so much about just using P values. It's about kind of using them as this sort of dummy indicator, you know, Oh, we, we passed a threshold. We automatically get to, you know, it's yeah. like you, get, you get to collect some of your dollars and go past go. You know what I mean? It's a little bit like that. And I think yeah, that's, that's exactly what he's saying. Don't do right. Say don't yeah. use that as a decision rule. Right. Well, I mean, it's, I think it's part of the decision rule. Right. I mean, I think that's that's that's, that's the thing is, um, yeah, you need to have more than that. Well, he talks about like how to move beyond this hypothesis testing in the last section. But I skipped over the help study thing, which is very interesting, but um, mm -hmm. I, I didn't feel like it would be worthwhile going over again to my view i thought it was interesting but you know yeah it's long um, and then he gives uh he encourages everybody to use bayesian here <laughs> of course yeah well, that's that's his bag yeah for sure he loves right it. yeah and, and i'm not exactly 100 percent sure how he's going to show us how bayesian prevents some of these things in the, but i'm hoping that will that'll come through i'm actually i know for sure it's got to come through in the rest of this book but mm -hmm. uh, but he says it's important to analyze all your data. Don't just like, you know, pre-filter like, oh, you know, by various methods, right? Um, even the data looks bad, analyze it, you know, put things in there to account for why you think it's bad or whatever, model that, but um, don't don't filter it out. Um, present all your comparisons, don't down select, right? Don't make, don't just only show the predictors that are interesting, right? Uh, or comparisons that are interesting. And the third ball is, I think, very interesting. You know, to the extent possible, when you publish study, make your data public. That's how many times it drives me crazy when they don't, when people publish these studies, and I'm like, oh, I'm interested in that. I'd like to look at it in a little more detail or a different way, maybe. And like, no, you can't. <laughs> yeah, that still hasn't gotten better. That's there's actually been a bunch of studies on this about like oh. you know, with increased like you know with increased um, policies for sharing data and stuff like that. There's supposed to be all of this like improved. You know, ability to get data, but um, I forget where I've read this, but like there's a bunch of ones where people have gone and asked, you know, authors, hey, can we can we see the data? Can we see like, you know, it doesn't even have to be identified, right? And a lot of times people will just say no, because there's no, it's, it's like, um, it's like the UN, you know, it's like, okay, yeah. the UN said you yeah. had to do this. Well, you can come to your army and make me do it, right? It's like, that's the problem is there's no follow through with, um, 
you know, there's no power on the part of, you know, the, the administrators, I guess you could say. Uh, he also says that one should, uh, to avoid these type M, type S errors, which, you know, you can either study big differences, uh, large differences, large samples, or just accept uncertainty and embrace variation. That's what he says. I love that. Yeah. Embrace it with the Bayesian methods. Um, so I think that's going to be a theme throughout the book. And I, and mm -hmm. I just added this thing, that same article by Gelman and Loken, uh, this is actually a clickable link in the notes you can get on Slack, um, encourages this idea of pre-publication replication when possible. Often it's not possible because often you're studying data, like you said, Ryan, you're studying data mm -hmm. that's already out there and you can't do anything about it. But uh, when you can do a pre-publication replication study, that's uh, kind of a gold standard, right? I mean, like if I find this large signal, I do the study again with new data, you know, focusing on that one signal I thought was big, and I see it again, that's, you know, that's that avoids this issue of uh, the p-hacking. Right? I think it's also like, I think one of the other big issues is, um, this is one of the reasons why, I mean, I don't know if we'll touch on this next week, but I think this is one of the reasons why simulation is so popular because now you can not only do like power analysis and sample size simulations, but you can also like simulate what you, you know, the, the study ought to find if you make different types of assessments or different right. types of assumptions. And Right, yeah. I think that is, kind yeah. of little, or maybe not that part of it, I think it is part of the theme in the, in the book. Mm -hmm. So that's basically that chapter. I, I thought it was pretty interesting. I'm looking forward to um, the simulation chapter. I'm also looking forward to getting into the actual linear regression part of this and, and you know, understand the parameters mm -hmm. that you get and all the rest of that um, in part two of the book. So this next session uh, simulation will be the end of part one, which will be finally moving on to the real stuff, so to speak. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but the simulation part is interesting. I'm a, uh, I, do you want to do it this way? Do you want to start next week with the simulation? And then if that way to make sure we have time, and then I will do a, a couple exercises at the end. I think that okay. maybe we should do okay. it. Sure. Even, yeah. even though it's exercise in the previous chapter, I think that it all kind of goes together, right? Yeah, sounds good. Mm -hmm. and I'll just sounds pick a couple good. that yeah. look interesting to me. I haven't done that yet, but I will look and see if there's something that I can do as well. easy. I mean, I did already do one exercise from chapter five, because that's what's that, um, to do that uh, coverage thing, this. Right here is actually an exercise from chapter five. Oh, okay, <laughs> this one? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, uh, where is it? 5.7, yeah, I think. Hmm. But, or something like 5.7 anyway. And so I will next week pull a couple, maybe one or two, three, uh, chapter four exercises that look interesting, just to kind of drive home these things. And then chapter five, uh, exercises um if you want to too like grab one of those that you think is interesting uh, or okay. not it's up to you how you want to present it but yeah sounds good yeah well anyway look i really appreciate uh you guys coming in the making yeah it's a bummer I, like i was i was about ready to call it doa and the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, Wait, I, I i have a question so um in the work I do now, we do a lot of t-tests. Oh, so yeah. like in all this stats and everything, where do t-tests fall? Like a t-test not as good as regressions or it's mm. like, because what we are trying to do is, um, is an NGO that a, gives math remedial work to mm. third to fifth graders. So there's a control group, and then there's kids who get uh, SMS like questions, and then there's kids who get phone calls and SMS. Mm -hmm. And then, like, we're doing t tests from the like comparing the control group, and then those who do the SMS, and then the control group, and then those who do like the SMS and the phone. And I'm just like trying mm -hmm. to, like, I'm learning stats. I'm doing this work i'm just trying to is this is te are teachers good or it's just trying to oh. do regressions like get more covariates and do regressions so i don't know no this is i mean uh t-tests are like foundational especially if you're doing like so you're comparing groups right so you have a control group and then you have like a proper you know intervention group right so i would say t-tests are always when well we talked about t the t distribution which was um by um i forget what his name is but we call it, um, um fisher you know, 
It's it's actually by no, but no, Fisher. It wasn't Fisher. Fisher invented the um, F test. He invented ANOVA. Okay. No, yeah. We got his name was well, you know it's called students T test because um, the guy who was he was I think he was um, he was actually a statistician for um, Guinness. You know the beer, mm -hmm. and um, so he couldn't put his name on the the T test because um, oh it's oh god damn it um, sorry I forget who the I name was. Yes, Gossett. Thank you, Gossett. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, yeah, it's basically the only way that we have really I means, you know, sort of parametric way that we have to compare the means of two groups, right? So in this case, it's, you know, you have the group that is um, whatever, getting the intervention, then you're getting the, you know, the non-intervention. Now, if there's more than two groups, you got to start pulling out an ANOVA, right? Mm -hmm. um, because you need to compare three or more groups and you know now you're trying to get like is there a difference anywhere in these three groups that's all you're trying to do with a one f with one f test um but w w the difference the, the, there is no difference really between t tests and um regression because think about this in regression you can put a categorical predictor right or a continuous predictor i'm not sure if you had experience with that but yes yes yeah so but, i mean if you, if but i was thinking that why do we just because the it's just we're just saying that the difference in mm -hmm. their math scores was due to the like intervention but there's so many other covariates yes. we did not measure so it's like exactly. yeah. like isn't it wrong to just associate that the difference in the mean math scores or oh no with teachers we are saying we are trying to see if the difference between Mm -hmm. the mean mass goals is statistically significant right, right? yes yes yeah. but to your point okay so a t-test only does what's called an unadjusted test right which means the only difference that you're you're comparing is on who got what intervention right so control yes. intervention but so so you may so let's say you find a statistically significant difference between those two groups right mm -hmm. but you don't but to your point it may be because of Previous, previous education or, or 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 socioeconomic status or gender. I mean, there's a million reasons why you know, like for different types of things, like you know, um, that might. So what you what you would want to do is do a linear regression, which we'll talk about, and you know, like with with one predictor. I think that's the first chapter is like just one predictor. But then, like a typical thing you would do in educational research like this is you'd have your predictor, you know, your, your condition predictor, right? Which is, you know, in, intervention versus control. And then you'd have all of your covariates included in that model, right? And if you still have a statistically significant difference by condition, what, you're, what you can say is, is after we controlled for gender, socioeconomic status, educational, whatever all the things that you have, which it sounds like you don't have them, which is a bummer, right? But um, mm -hmm. But like, yeah, so that would be awesome then, because then you could say, after we adjusted for the effects of X, Y, and Z, we still found a, a statistically significant, that's what we mean by adjust, uh, an adjusted model, right? Okay, so, okay. okay. Yeah. But in T-test, we are using statistics, like there's no way to get around statistical significance in T-test. Like, there's no, it's there's okay. no way, oh, there's, is there any way to get around the unadjusted aspect? No. Because no, you, yeah. like, because we said, using statistical significance is bad but with t-test oh. like well yeah okay those yeah do you have any what did you, i'm sorry i'm talking a lot ron do you uh, i think what she's saying here no is, your insights are good <laughs> I'm, I'm well i think <laughs> okay so to your point is right exactly like so for the t-test we don't have any i mean we have we can get confidence intervals and we can get you know test values which is sort of like you know um, um, a proxy for the strength of the relation a t-test you know t-score um t-value um it's not so much that that, that p-values are bad it's that you know um you i think what he's saying is is you know let's let's make sure that we're looking at everything before we just say oh we found the significant difference on the t-test we're good, right? There may, you know, you might, you know, you, you, one of the ways that we do this in medicine and in education is what's called a sensitivity analysis. Are you familiar with that concept kind of maybe? No? no. So Okay. So like one way you could do this would be, you know, um, 
uh, we, you know, after we you do your original model, you realize, let's say like almost, you know, like 30% of the people in your sample also had some other experience that may be relevant, but you didn't, you know, con you know, control for that. So what you might do is just, you know, look at the people who had that particular experience as a subgroup, right? Like, so maybe it's, they've had an iPad and they've done like an online course before or something like that. That that was like the difference or something. Okay. So maybe just, mm -hmm. to, see, just to see if there's still differences, um, you might look at only the iPad users, you know, that are in the control versus, you know, the intervention group as a way of saying, okay, even when we just look at people, you know, in this subgroup, we still see the, the difference. That's what you're kind of trying to look at is, you know, do we find this relationship is durable, right? If we, you know, does that make sense? Like, if we, if we mess with the data too much, do we? Does the relationship fall? I mean, by and by messing, I mean like, you know, um, like if we only find the relationship and we include certain covariates, or you know, if we, if we code the data a certain way, that's a problem. We want to be able to find the results in in a, in a variety of ways. I guess that makes sense. I'm maybe not. I don't know. But what do you think, Ron? No, I think that's a great explanation. And I did point out that in section 7.3 does in the chapter on single predictor, he does talk about, you know, doing this kind of uh, a categorical variable and how it compares to doing the, uh, he doesn't call it the t-test, but the same thing we just talked about where you can, yeah. you know, students t distribution is your, um, sample distribution. Well, yeah, I think it, it, it makes sense that like you just use the t-test as your first thing to see that, okay, did our intervention work? Like, was there a significant difference between the math scores of the control and the intervention? Then you go and find out why is there a significant difference? That's mm -hmm. linear regression exactly. can yes. give you more information of why there is a significant difference. Exactly. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. yeah and you know, if you had more data, you could probably tease that apart. But if you don't have the data, then it's just sort of left to you know, you, you can't know, right? But um, if you, if, yeah, I mean, maybe that's, that's why we do follow-up studies, right? It's like, oh, you know, in the previous study, we found this difference, but we didn't test for X, Y, or Z. Um, and so, yeah, if you can get those relevant things, but yeah, it's interesting. Guess, but only thing I would add is I would say that I don't think you should take away from the chapter that significant tests are bad. I, it's just the idea that you should be cautious with them. And he does say that he, doesn't use them as decision, like final decision things, but he does use them in the, he does use them, like you were saying, like initially to look at things, um, to decide what things to uh, do follow-up studies on, all that kind of thing. He does, what did he say exactly in the book? He says, because it's kind of funny, yeah. he says, don't use the decision rules, but then later he goes, I do use it to make decisions. <laughs> but, yeah, he said something. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is this is one of the, the real, I mean, issues in all of um, stats, I feel like we're in all research is where we're constantly saying one thing but doing another. <laughs> I think it's just, it's just, it's just constantly a concern with um, just not using it as a panacea or like as yeah. a miracle thing. It's not, a, it's that it's not just because you have a significant test doesn't mean that you you know, you're out of the woods entirely, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I, think, I think also a lot of it has to do with just the general cultural aspect of being an analyst or a statistician, which is just skepticism. You know, that's that's our job, I think, in some ways, is to be highly skeptical um, of, of anything, even stuff that we believe in, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's, I think that's what he's, you know, I think that's what a lot of people are speaking to is, this, mm -hmm. this idea that you know um even in the face of you know supporting evidence for what you believe you know be skeptical be uncertain you know and think about ways of testing your assumptions that you haven't done yet instead of just being like yeah we have a significant yeah test. that's that's i guess this is cautionary be cautious right that's what that yeah, is. yeah. yeah. understand have you know make sure you understand what you're doing don't just you know turn the crank and say here we go p equals 0 0.049 we're good <laughs> yeah, it's funny, it's, it's funny too because there's been a lot of like movements um, to try to come up with like an alternative way instead of just saying automatically do like 0.05 and stuff like that. And there have been people that have proposed, oh, let's just make it 0.001 or let's make it 0.001 or make it 0.005 or whatever. And it all comes down to this, which is 
I don't think we're ever going to get like a proper like shortcut that's going to you know solve all of our problems. Right. Even you know, I mean, now if we were to increase the the, the alpha level to like 0 0.01, probably we you know, probably would probably be better because we would have fewer sort of like false positives. But it would just be like another game, you know what I mean? Like that would just you know it would just be uh, another kind of cut, you know, arbitrary yeah. cutoff or whatever. But anyway, yeah. And bigger, bigger type M errors it would happen, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, it'd be less likely to have S errors. Or was that yeah. S errors? Yeah, because you know, with that 0.05 level, I mean, you know, obviously you're going to bring in kind of more iffier results. But you know, when you get to this 0.01 or, or higher or, or smaller, I should say. Yeah. Well, well where he said like we do use hypothesis testing for something. Yeah, he said he used it for non-rejection. Says the idea is that non-rejection tells us that there's not enough information in the data to move ah, beyond yeah, there you go. the null yeah. hypothesis. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Right. Well. I guess we'll see you uh, guys next week. And I yeah, to so it. we're going to do some exercises, but also Amma's going to do simulations yeah. first, and then we'll. Okay, perfect. I'm I'll glad we have you on board, Amma. That's awesome. Yeah, I'll post which exercises I plan to do once I figure that out. If you guys want to try them as well. Cool. Okay. Cool. Yeah. All right. All right. Cool. See ya. See ya. All right. Bye. Bye.